power. That's power right there. It's making you stand up the whole time. That's power. Um, so, yeah, I wanted to uh, share the word right off the bat this morning because of the scriptures that were chosen, because there's a very practical, valid lesson, a very practical, valid teaching that comes through the Old Testament today. And that is the response to God's grace. Because we're going to see two different responses. Let's look at Jonah. And we don't have to go too far into Jonah 4. And we're going to spend this week and next concluding our journey with Jonah. And then, of course, we're going to journey with Jesus. But listen to the verbs now. Listen to where Jonah goes. And we have to remember this real crucial fact. One, we don't know why the psalmist is responding the way he is responding other than the fact that he just loves God. He's just overwhelmed at that moment. You know what I mean? He's just feeling it, so to speak. We don't know if he witnessed a miracle or it doesn't say that. He's just, God, you are great and mighty and I am just overwhelmed by your majesty and I give it all to you. Right? What do we know about Jonah? We've journeyed with him, getting, tugging back and forth with God, doing what he was supposed to do, eventually did it. He has witnessed and is witnessing one of the greatest miracles in all of Scripture, one of the greatest spiritual miracles. And that is the turning of 120,000 wicked hearts. Now they are committed, like we talked about last week, to a life of repentance. They are demonstrating it. They didn't just give it lip service to try to save themselves. They're doing it from the top down. Burlap and ashes and dirt and the whole nine yards. Right? They're living it. And he's witnessing this. So he is seeing that. And this is what, this is like I said, you say what you want about Jonah. I've called him a few names. Jonah was furious at God. He witnesses the majesty of the Lord. He sees 120,000 wicked hearts turning. And what is his response? He was furious at the Lord. And I've looked at all the translations, and they use all the same verbs and all the same tense, which is important. Oh, I know you guys are probably so bummed. You're like, man, I come here to church. I got to go to school. Verbs. <laughs> Tenses. Jonah was furious. Furious. He lost his temper. He yelled at God. God, I knew it when I was back home. I knew this was going to happen. That's why I ran off to Tarshish. I knew you were sheer grace and mercy, not easily angered, rich in love, ready at the drop of a hat to turn your plans of punishment into a program of forgiveness. So God, if you won't kill them, kill me. I'm better off dead. Did you ever read it that way before? Regardless of what translation you're in, did you ever set that context? Did you ever set that context? And put, him, put yourself in the position of sitting on that hill or you know, watching this miracle happen, this miracle of repentance. Have you ever prayed and, 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 and he heard this prayer, this anger toward God? He was furious and he lost his temper and he yelled at God. Now, being furious and losing our temper and yelling at God, we can all nod our heads. Been there, done that, things happen, you work it out. But for this, you know, it's like, I, don't, I, don't, I, I can't find like an everyday example. I guess it would be like being a, a reluctant pastor or something. Like, I don't really want to do this job. I really don't like you people. I really despise Sunday mornings, but I'm doing it because God is ordering me to. 
and tells me uh, whatever. He'll punish me if I don't. And then watching people through the preaching be converted and me going, well, oh, whatever, Donna, whatever. Just go to heaven. I don't care. I, I, don't, I don't know what example to give of what he's doing here. It's crazy. You would think that even the hardest heart of Jonah would be turned when he just, he, he preached. He was asked by God to, and he did it, and he preached, and the Holy Spirit moved, and hearts were moved. And people began to respond, not just by saying, oh, that's awesome, save me, Lord, but by living it and doing it. And he's like, I knew it. You can almost hear him just calling God names, like, why are you, you know? So what do we learn about this? Justice, can you go back to the psalm, the opening scripture? There's a couple really important things to learn about our response that I think are really brought out in these two scriptures as we began to look at them on Wednesday and then began to stay with them from Wednesday till now. I think that we were led to them for not only the obvious reason. The obvious reason is what? The, the difference that you see here. This person, we don't know why this person is so overwhelmed and overcome with the Holy Spirit and feeling so good about God. We don't know that reason, but look at what he says. What are we supposed to do? Give thanks. The first thing. He doesn't talk about circumstances. He doesn't talk about, we don't know where he is. We don't, you know, all of these different things. We can assume an authorship of the psalm and those sorts of things, but we don't know even David went through some horrible things. We don't know what he's going through. He says, give thanks. Give thanks to the Lord and proclaim his greatness. Period. There's no qualifiers. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. There's no, you know, if the Lord does this, then give thanks. None, none of that. Just one statement. Give thanks to the Lord. Proclaim his greatness. Let the whole world know what he has done. What has he done? You know what I mean? We don't know what, but we can kind of gather. He's moving in this person's life. And again, we, we talk about real life circumstances, all the good, the bad, and the ugly, and all of those different things. This person had all of that. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Look what he is doing in my life, period. No qualifiers. And then he says, let's praise. Sing to him. Sing. Tell everyone. This person is responding is responding in song, responding by, by speaking the word, by proclaiming the word, by proclaiming God's greatness. Uh, next slide, Justice, please. Exult, right? Rejoice, exult. Show your exuberance. Don't hide it under a basket. Let it go. Exult in the Lord. Rejoice. Are you feeling it? This, this should have been Jonah. Jonah. I'd like to think that if I saw what he saw, experienced what he experienced, I would be telling, wanting to tell the world, rejoice, exult. Tell the world what has happened here at Nineveh. It's amazing. Exult, rejoice, and search for the Lord. Search for the Lord. Seek the Lord. Remember. Right? Are you getting that? Right? Now here's the question. Bonus. Double bonus points. What kind of verbs are they? Go back to school now. Two general types of verbs. Don't look at me that way, Maddie. What types of verbs are they? Action verbs. Action verbs. He is worshiping. He is responding. He is actioning back toward God. In our best moments, that's us. In our best moments, we recognize this as a relationship and we action back to God. We give back, we exalt, we praise, we speak, we search, we look for, we tell people. We pray. Reaction. It's a relationship. 
And in our best moments with the Lord and with each other, that's what we do. Justice, let's go to Jonah then. Boom, 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 back. Jonah was furious. He lost his temper. He yelled at God. I knew it. When I was back home, I knew this was going to happen. That's why I ran off. So there are some action verbs there, right? I knew, sort of. I ran. But he was furious. He lost his temper. Next slide. I knew you were sheer grace and mercy, not easily angered, rich in love, and ready at the drop of a hat to turn your plans of punishment into a program of forgiveness. So God, if you won't kill them, kill me. I'm better off dead. kind of verbs are brought up there. Passive verbs. Jonah's sitting there, feeling sorry for himself, saying, God, do whatever you want to me. Even the action verbs that he has in terms of losing his temper, not good verbs, not good responses. But Jonah is resigned now, and the relationship is unhealthy. God is giving, giving, giving. We see that through the whole book of Jonah. Jonah simply will not receive. He will not give back. Jonah will not give back. He will not return kindness for kindness. He will not return grace for grace. He will not return exalting for exalting. He will not return the positive actions of God with positive actions of his own. He will not listen, and, and when God gives to him, Jonah will not give to others. Instead, in his selfish nature, and we know Jonah's model <laughs> of selfish nature is just going to sit there and say, do to me, Lord, whatever you want to do to me. I don't care. He's sitting and he's willing to receive, but he's not willing to give. And I just think that when, as I looked at this this week, it is an incredible picture of how we behave, even as believers and as saved people, let alone unbelievers and unsaved people. And we talk about big things, like that big pinata God in the sky, right? You, you bang on him, it, right? What are we doing? We're sitting and we're waiting and we're saying to God, I deserve this, give it to me. I deserve this, give it to me. Pay my bills, give me a house, give me a car, give me a whatever, material things, or even if we're looking for relationships or whatever the case may be. I deserve it, give it to me. Or the converse unhealthy way of that is, I don't deserve anything, Lord, just pound on me. And we know that we feel that way in churches sometimes and some folks have been brought to us and they have felt that way throughout the course of their experience. That, you know, I'm not worthy at all. Pound on me. And we're not recognizing the relationship. Now, mind you, I'm not talking about, well, New Testament teaching here. We're going, Jonah is one of the oldest books. God is creating throughout the course of all Scripture, this idea of a healthy relationship with God. It's not one-sided. It's not God lording Himself over you, waiting to pound on you and beat on you every time that you make a mistake. And it's not you sitting there saying, I've been good, I don't make any mistakes, so give me everything that I want. Think about that in the context of our human relationships. Both of those are incredibly unhealthy. Clearly, in the psalm, God is talking about actionable verbs. He is talking about responding with ourselves, much like who? Much like the evil people of Nineveh did. Here's Jonah a prophet of God, 
and we've seen this before in his word and in his deed, a prophet of God with this unhealthy view of this relationship with God, a prophet of God, someone whom we are to receive the word of God from. And he is the negative example of that relationship. And we look over at the evil people of Nineveh. We look at those. And again, you can fill in the blank with whatever group, organization, whatever is, is that you want to out there, where a Christian could walk into and be killed. You, the evil people of Nineveh had the positive response. Now, if, if you look inside Jonah and we see that, that is incredible. We see the power of God. And that breaks us from this mindset that within this sanctuary, we're all saved and to heck with the rest of the world. We got it. We, we're, we got it figured out. We're okay. Yeah, are you? How are you responding? No, I don't mean you are. You don't know, you know, question yourself, right? Think, challenge yourself. How are you responding? How do you respond on a daily basis? Nobody Nobody lives Psalm 105 all the time. You know, it's no. And we have our moments and our times. Yes, but where's your heart? Are you in a healthy relationship with God? Are you responding with action verbs? I rejoice, I tell, I seek, I pray. Or are you responding with passive verbs? Just do this to me, Lord. Kill me. Woe is me. Tell me what to do. I don't care. Pile it on. Or just give me, Lord. Give me. Give me, Lord. Give me. Of all the people here, I deserve what I deserve. Yeah, you do. You deserve hell. Is what we deserve. Which makes us turn around and say, wow, thank you. <laughs> thank you. So Jonah, it, it, just, it just fascinates me and he... He, he has. He's fascinated me. He's taught me so much um, over this, this past weeks that we've spent with him. And to stand there and say, just kill me now. If you won't kill them, then kill me. I'm better off dead. It's left up to us. You know what, here we go, another English lesson. You know what hyperbole is, right? When you overspeak something. When you say, you know, that I'm the best in the whole world, whatever. Is this hyperbole? Is this a kid saying, well then just, I don't know. Kill me now if you won't give me something. Is this one of those reactions? Or does Jonah truly, is that really where his heart is? We don't know that, but we know that his words are extremely powerful regardless. That reaction to God is unhealthy. If you truly mean it, it's incredibly unhealthy. If you're in hyperbole mode and you're like, well, if you won't do it, then just kill me now. I don't care. But you don't really mean it. You're just, that's, that's how much disrespectful is that? Either way. And I'm going to go back to it again. Seeing one of the greatest miracles in all of Scripture and wishing everybody who was saved was dead. You got to put it, it doesn't work if you don't think of that. Wishing everybody that was saved was dead. Can you imagine I, as your pastor, it's like, you know, I'm doing this because I have to. I don't care if you guys live or die. As a matter of fact, if you're all dead, I have Sunday mornings off. Don't record that part. <laughs> I don't know what, I don't know how, what context to put this in. I you know, as, as, a, as a person called to preach the gospel, I would just love to see what Jonah saw and experience that. And I pray every day, 
I pray this Sunday, Lord, use me for that purpose. I, I want to see that. I just can't get over him. I can't get over him. I want to pick him up and just, mm, mm, what are you doing? But then we go back and we say, God knew what he was doing because he knew that this book was going to be written for all of us thousands of years later to be learning about a healthy relationship with God. So that puts it back into, okay, God knew Jonah. <laughs> God was handling Jonah. Um, and then I don't, well, I still feel bad for him. I just think he missed out on so much. God, and we're, we're going to finish here this morning and finish off next week. God said, what do you have to be angry about? But Jonah just left. This is when he leaves the city. He went out of the city to the east and sat down in a sulk. He put together a makeshift shelter of leafy branches and sat there in the shade to see what would happen to the city, no doubt still wishing fire and brimstone, still wishing Sodom and Gomorrah upon them. What would happen to the city? How many of you as parents, when you ask your child a question over the years and they ignored you and turned around and walked away? Uh-huh, <laughs> lots of eyebrows went up. <laughs> Did you catch that? Did you catch that? How many of you have been directly spoken to by God and said, rolled your eyes and turned around and walked away? I haven't. Jonah did. Did you catch that? God said to Jonah, because Jonah's freaking out, watching everybody in burlap, sitting down, repenting. He's watching this miracle take place, and, and he says, yeah, I wish they were all dead. I knew you were going to do this. You're so kind, and, so, and I just wish they were all dead. And if they're not all dead, I wish I were dead, and I couldn't, didn't have... God says, Jonah... Jonah, what do you have to be angry about? <sighs> and ignored him and turned around and walked away. <laughs> God arranged for a broadleaf tree to spring up. This is around verse 6. It grew over Jonah to cool him off and get him out of the angry sulk. And this is where we'll end. Jonah was pleased and enjoyed the shade. Life was looking up. What is this guy like? Eight? No offense to eight-year-olds. But seriously, he's like, oh, okay, it's all better now. I have a tree to sit under. Oh, well, at least I can hope for the destruction of Nineveh and the death of 120,000 souls. Well, I'm cool. As long as I'm cool, in the shade, I got a little shelter going on, a little iced tea. You know what? It is really all about me. God is showing me that again. Thank you. It is about me. Whatever. Really? Who is this guy? I mean, it, he just fascinates me. Have I said that? Because he's so real. He's so real. Think about any typical day that you have and tell me that you have not gone through all of these cycles that Jonah has gone. From the selfish to the selfless to the thinking more about yourself than others, to giving and receiving and this, this kind of tit-for-tat with God, you know? You give me, I'll give you. Okay, will you give me a little bit more because, oh, well, I am better than this next person. I mean, all of the different things that we've talked over these weeks. I mean, how many of us don't go through that cycle almost on a daily basis? So he's happy again. Life is looking up. Wait a minute, dude. Like, you just wanted God to kill you 30 seconds ago. Oh, but it's okay now. I'm out of the city. I got a little shade. I'm feeling better. It is about me. I've been reminded of that. We'll see next week <laughs> that God says, oh, yeah? What? But anyway, you know, it is about me. God made a tree. I'm in the shade. It's all good. He loves me. I'm his favorite. What's that old uh, uh, sarcastic T-shirt? says, Jesus loves you but I'm his favorite. You ever see that one? Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> that, I mean, that's what Jonah's thinking right now. Okay, God loves those people, but I'm his favorite. He's taking good care of me. I'm all right. As long as I'm getting mine, I'm cool. Literally cool. It's in the middle of the desert. So I encourage you to go through four again. Go through four again. Read it with these new eyes. 
Look at the verbs. Look at his response. Look at God's continuous, steady response. If I had this much patience as a parent, parent of the year every year my entire life, because I would not have had this much patience <laughs> with Jonah. Well, I'm not God. <laughs> but just look at God's steady hand, his steady response, his steady heart. Even in his teaching moments, when he's about to give Jonah a little bit more tough love, he's given him a lot of tough love up to now. And then next week, we're going to see the final piece of the tough love. And we're going to see Jonah's response as being loveless. Loveless. Think about that. God is love. Jonah is loveless in all that he's done. He's loveless. He's done it. He's been obedient. But he's been absolutely loveless. And that's where we're going to head and where we're going to finish. Because we're going to talk about God's ultimate love from there on out as we celebrate the resurrection.